Well, you know why they can't go out and start talking about the atonement, because when they start talking about atonement, then they have to uh, address the other feast days also. They don't Ooh, want to do yes, that. indeed. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> We had a good experience uh, on Day of Atonement over at uh, the Schultz. There was uh, a brother there and his wife. They had just come out of Catholicism. And um, he didn't, he was very skeptical. But uh, anyway, he, he saw the point. Um, it, it's really good to see it when you, when you do line them up. And uh, they're a compacted prophecy of the whole gospel plan. And um, when you see it like that, you know, and our foundation is a day of atonement, you know, you, you see the importance of the rest of them. So mm -hmm. like you were just saying, you know, you start talking too much about that. It's going to bring the others into light too. Yep. And um, that's the purpose. <laughs> it's the purpose. Exactly. 100%. You know, what gets me is the fact they don't want to keep God's days that he ordained in Leviticus 23rd. But boy, they'll go whole hog to keep Satan's days that the Pope of Rome has substituted for God's days. Yeah, you're right. Only thing they keep on the Leviticus 23 is the Sabbath. Yeah, and that and that's one of the things that gets me to see a Sunday keeper trying to keep the seven feast days. Mm -hmm. It's like We've a sore thumb. Happen, <laughs> we have seen it. <clears throat> well, I know, well, Dean. We're we're headed back to. Uh, to the Catholic Church, we're not coming out. We're headed back. Most yes. of the churches are doing that. I know this yep. pastor. He's a Mexican pastor, and he's pretty high honored by many Mexicans. And he's been lifting up um, the Virgin Mary. And oh, he's a, he's a Seventh Day Adventist. Oh, yeah, Bullion. Pastor Bullion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was tragic. First time I saw that. Well, it says we should, they'll all go out there after the beast. Yep. Yep. We have to stay strong and stay with the word no matter what. No matter what. And it makes me feel good that I can come on here with God's people and, and everybody wants to stick to the word. But if, <clears throat> if I was in the state of Washington, I'd run up and give Sandy a hug. She always wants to stay with the word, with the word. Well, you know, That's studying good. studying the word, then praying, and then obeying what God tells us is yep. the only thing that's going to get us through. That's right. That is so right. Indeed, indeed. What you just said says <clears throat> praying and obeying. You know, to have the, I don't know how many of you, when you had uh, intellectual uh, ascent or conversion, but uh, not the obedience to it. <laughs> it was uh, futile, wasn't it? I mean, it's good to have it in your head, but you know, like you said, Marty, is uh, praying and obeying, and then when you do that, it seems to open up for more light <clears throat> and more power to obey. And, and it gives us a more. Blessing. It's not a bondage. It gives us more to come at Satan with when he comes at us. Because how did Jesus answer him? It is written. It is written. Well, if you haven't studied the word, you don't know what's written. Right. True. So you can't use it. Mm. That's the reason you have to study the word, pray, and then be obedient. Oh. You're so right, Marty. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. The next person can go whenever they're ready. Is that you, Dean? I think so. Yeah, we have to wait All for right. Sandy because she needs to stop and get it back online. I've, I've done that. <clears throat> so I just want to welcome everybody that's watching and everybody that's on here. Okay. Excellent as usual. Okay. Um, I got to get my sword here just a second, just in case. All right. Yeah, um, it might help to have a few extra minutes too, because uh, 
You know me, I'm long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eugene. Really appreciate it. Hey, that. I understand. I can get long-winded too, but I kind of <laughs> got it down to an art now. About 45 minutes to 50 minutes. Let me make one quick comment, Dean. You're talking about your sword. Mm -hmm. If you saw it, it's an S in word, so it's spirit and word makes the sword. Ah, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. That's good. So um, the modern I'm going to go ahead, Sandy. The modern day weapon is the 66 shooter. 66 books of the Bible. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to get rid of this bar again. I always have trouble with it. There we go. Okay, so let's have a little <clears throat> word of prayer. And this is a kind of a basic uh, one, and it is really meant to give people uh, some answers to, to the skeptics. And uh, I found that this worked uh, just a couple of days ago to really help somebody out to see the blessings in the appointed times. And um, I'd like to have a word of prayer and we'll get underway. Heavenly Father, I'm very grateful for the time that you set aside for us and that you call us together. And you said that if through your son, if we walk in the light, even as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. I thank you that we can have that fellowship with each other here on earth, but also because we're connected with you in heaven. Thank you for the atonement. Please grant us your spirit to lead and guide us through the inspiration that we're going to look at and store it in our minds that we can help others to receive the blessing as well. Um, just shine your light through us. And thank you so much. In the name of your son, Yeshua. Amen. Okay, uh, this is going to be a three part and uh, it's called Foundations is the main uh, title, but today is called the morality of time because uh, so many people try to uh, put the appointed times in a ceremonial light. And um, though ceremonies is only used one time in the Bible, uh, it's actually in relation to the uh, second Passover in the book of Numbers. Um, but we do understand it just like uh, millennium is a term that you don't find in the Bible, but we all understand that that's a thousand years. But uh, it's really misapplied to make offenders out of those people that want to keep appointments with our father. Um, so let's look at that and see if we can disarm some and maybe um, bless others. So I'd like to start with, <clears throat> pardon me, Psalms uh, 11 verses 1 through 5. In the Lord put I my trust, how say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow and make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may shoot privily at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord tries the righteous, but the wicked in him that loves violence, his soul hates. Sometimes it's hard for people to take that in, that there is something or even uh, that he hates. But the ones that do violence, especially to the foundations of the word of God and the foundations of our movement, which is a movement toward him, by the way, um doesn't take kindly to so um what i want to do is look at some foundational quotes um early even before 1844 and that the advent movement uh kept tabernacles camp meetings and i want to go back to october 6 and this was from a poster advertising that tabernacles camp meeting in 1842 and uh, <clears throat> you can find this in the Pioneer uh, writing, September 21st, 1842, from Joshua Himes. Okay, of those who love and wait for the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ to glorify his saints and destroy them that destroy the earth is to be holden, the Lord willing, at Salem, Massachusetts, in Northfields. 
The meeting is to commence on Thursday, October 6, 1842, and to continue about one week. Several lecturers on the coming of Christ are expected to be present and will show from the word of God the manner and object of Christ's second coming together with reasons for expecting him in 1843. All who love the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ are affectionately invited to rally at this Feast of Tabernacles. Our time is growing shorter and shorter each day, and what is to be done must be done soon. The great object of the meeting is, like those who have already been held, to arouse both the church and the world to a sense of their peril by sounding the midnight cry. You know, I'd like to read from the Day Star. There's a really wonderful article in there about the midnight cry, and especially uh, in relation to those who are on that path. And if they deny the light that's behind them, they will lose their footing and not be able to follow up the path that gets narrower and narrower uh, to the light of Yeshua ahead of them. Um, but that would be a good one for us to look at because it says in Review and Herald, this is Sister White, August 19th, 1890, I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. The parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application to this time and like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time, unquote. So when we look at this, and by the way, that, uh, that quote from Joshua Himes is before the seventh month movement, before they made some corrections and understanding. Uh, but going back to this parable of the 10 virgins uh, from which the midnight cry comes, if we're going to repeat this history to the very letter, um, it would be good for us to know our history. Very good to know our foundations. And um, most of us don't know what the faith once delivered. Our movement or even in the apostolic movement, but they were keepers of the appointed times. And we're going to look at that quite the a bit. Interesting side note, Dee, that uh, Mr. Uh, Hybes. He was never a Sabbatarian. Yeah. In fact, uh, that comes up, uh, especially with Bates, and uh, neither was William Miller a Sabbatarian. Yeah. And I happen, uh, I happen so, to own one of Joshua Hybes' hymn books, so I've done a lot of research on them. Right. So, um, you know, uh, light is progressive, and we were talking about that earlier in between the, the meetings here is that as we obey the light that we have by his grace, we're afforded more light. And um, there's a new light, very important light, present truth light for every generation. And so I wanna look at Joseph Bates' uh, uh, Sabbath conference. And by the way, he was a key instrument in bringing the seventh day Sabbath to Adventism, to the Advent movement. So reading from this, and it's uh, from Sabbath conference number three, 208 and 209 pages. Uh, according to the scriptures, God will deliver his people out of the time of trouble by his voice from heaven when he sealed them. And Christ has made the atonement and fitted the mansions in the new Jerusalem. Then they will be his chosen ones to execute the judgment written. After this, in the order of events, the Lord Jesus will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, etc. cetera. Uh, when God speaks from Jerusalem, then I believe the wise will understand how long it will be before Jesus comes. The times and seasons are with the Father. I believe the scriptures most clearly teach Christ's second coming at the Feast of Tabernacles and nowhere and excuse me, and nowhere else, and that our history in the fulfillment of the prophecy has been imperceptibly tending us there. I've got a little bar here I need to move. Okay, um, continuing on, uh, it, this uh, section is called the chain of feast applications. Here is the chain in the types. 
Three times a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God. These three feasts are typical of three of the most important events since the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, and every Advent believer should have a clear understanding of them. And by the way, every Advent believer, and when you look at the general condition of the church, most of them haven't got a clue. Why? I think there's a spiritual element hiding things from our eyes. I know it did me for a long time. <clears throat> First, the Feast of the Passover. Second, the Feast of Weeks. Third, the Feast of Tabernacles. First feast was the crucifixion of our Lord at the Passover on the 14th day of the first month at 3 o'clock p.m. That's interesting. Notes the hour. Second feast, the day of Pentecost, 1670 years from the time that the commandments were uttered by the voice of God in the morning, Exodus 19, 16, and then he says, see Acts 2, 15, undoubtedly at the same hour. Uh, third feast, on the 15th of the seventh month, the Feast of Tabernacles, this undoubtedly represents the gathering of all Israel at the coming of Christ, the end gathering of the harvest, the end of the 6,000 years, the end of the world. I see no other point of time for Christ to come than at the feast. You see Deuteronomy 16, Leviticus 23, Numbers 28 and 29. It cannot be possible that God has been so exact in the fulfillment of the first two to the very hour of the day and then left the other without order or time. No, no. Here is the gathering of all Israel. And he wants us to see Leviticus 23, 39 through 44. Second type in this uh, chain of feast applications, 27th verse, also on the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. Ye shall afflict in that same day, ye shall be cut off. He that shall not afflict shall be cut off from among his people. And I just want to refer back to Brother Eugene's message. Uh, very important. It was a type to represent the tried state, which the virgins in the parable entered into on the 10th day of this seventh month. And before I go on in that, um, when we look at this uh, chain of feast applications, we find that these three are all in reference to harvest. Uh, there was the barley harvest, there was the wheat harvest at Pentecost, and then there's the summer fruits, the final harvest in the seventh month. And the Day of Atonement uh, preceded by uh, trumpets to prepare us for that day is a ripening process for this final harvest. And if we keep that in mind, okay, moving back to the quote, 1844, uh, again, the parable entered into on the 10th day of this seventh month, 1844, when they see their Lord did not come, here is the atonement commenced with the affliction. And as they ended together in the type, so we believe they will in the anti-type, God speaks from Zion. And Joel 3, 16, and 17. This then, according to the type, proves the bridegroom as high priest officiating in the sanctuary, making the atonement for this same people. So as we're looking at these elements of the appointed times, does this pioneer uh, seem to make it sound like he believes that these divine feasts are abolished at the cross? or that they're merely ceremonial elements? Uh, doesn't seem to appear that way to me, uh, or I believe he's portraying it as a moral issue to be uh, even present truth, to be prepared for what is coming. And so let's keep going. The third type in order and the last feast the last in this feast is the Feast of Tabernacles. This is yet to come. The true point of our deliverance. What a harmonious, perfect chain is here. Now, I had to cut this down. Um, there is so much in this uh, Sabbath conference. But just see the first day of the seventh month. The seventh trumpet sounds. The mystery of God is finished. The virgins divide. On the tenth day of the same month, bridegroom comes to the wedding. 
a marriage takes place, door shut. Okay, so we're looking at probation there. Uh, jubilee trumpet sounds to prepare for the jubilee and supper in the kingdom of heaven. A cry at midnight with all its messages. And he says, destroy one link and the chain is broken. Take it in all its parts. It is perfect, harmonious, and complete. And when we look at these appointed times as a compacted prophecy and also a rehearsal to prepare us for that wedding feast, that we can be arrayed in the fine linen, clean and white, as we see in Revelation 19, and we're definitely looking at moral issues. And he wants us to be prepared for that wedding. And that's what these appointed times are all about. So um, there is violence to this chain and violence to the foundations by making time ceremonial and uh, theologically, ideologically nailing it to a cross. Uh, again, Review and Herald, August 19th. I would just like to read it once more, 1890. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. Is uh, present truth intrinsically moral, or is it just ceremonial? I leave that to you to decide, but, you know, we have these foundations, and if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord tries the righteous, but the wicked in him that loves violence, his soul hates. So there are those uh, among us uh, that even have some of the truths that we hold, but they do violence to the foundation that really is the restoration of the faith once delivered to the saints. It's a dangerous occupation doing violence to our foundations. So I believe our pioneers uh, took this very seriously, and they didn't judge or impeach the feast. Uh, which are called in more than one place statutes forever. Uh, that means perpetual, as abolished or nailed to the cross, uh, abolished at the cross or nailed to it, because sacrificial rites and ceremonies were once done on those times. Uh, if you use any consistency whatsoever, you would have to do away with the morning and evening worship. And pathfinders know this as the morning watch. <laughs> and uh, you would have to do away with the seventh-day Sabbath. So let's look at Colossians 2, 16 and 17. And I want to just leave out the supplied words because the emphasis is quite different. It says, let no man judge you therefore in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body of Christ. Now, if you go back to the uh, eighth verse in that same chapter and you look at uh, the philosophies, rudiments of the world, um, tradition, there's like a, a sandwich there of context, uh, the bread on that end, and then going down into the 22nd verse, you see that that's what is being talked about. And those that are judging the people in the respect of an holy day, uh, believe the Greek word is yorte, which would be like an annual feast day or the new moon, of course, that's self-explanatory, uh, or of the Sabbath. Now notice the tense, which are present tense, a shadow of things to come, future tense. But yet people will use this uh, to, they'll actually insert the word, which were a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ actually gives it a, a metaphorical sense. But this is talking about let no man who's involved with these philosophies, rudiments of the world, traditions, vain deceit, uh, judge you about these things. So the, the context is totally rearranged by the people who do violence uh, to the foundations. And 
I venture to apply that to something that the Lord hates when you destroy his word. Uh, Review and Herald, April 22nd, 1902. Paul did not represent either the moral or the ceremonial law as ministers in our day venture to do. Some cherish such antipathy to the law of God that they will go out of the way to denounce and stigmatize it. Thus they despise and pour contempt on the majesty and glory of God. That's not a job description I want. And yet many ministers, uh, even in the Advent movement, are quite bold to do so and uh, very dangerous. Um, Bible Commentaries, Volume 1, page uh, 1104, and this is uh, paragraph 7. Christ gave to Moses religious precepts, which were to govern everyday life. These statutes were explicitly given to guard the Ten Commandments. They were not shadowy types to pass away with the death of Christ. They were to be binding upon men in every age as long as time should last. These commands were enforced by the power of the moral law. And they clearly and definitely explained that law. Now, I want to, well, let me finish it up. Shall we stand as the peculiar people of God, or shall we trample upon the law of God and say it is not binding? God might just as well have abolished himself. In the law, every specification is the character of the infinite God. Might as well have abolished himself. So now let's come back and look at this uh, in relation to the statutes explicitly given to guard the Ten Commandments. I'd like to put it in a modern parable. Um, Are the Secret Service who guard the president, the president, is the Secret Service the president? No, but they guard the president. These statutes were explicitly given to guard the Ten Commandments. Now that would make them explicitly moral, wouldn't it? It explains to us how to observe and not transgress the Ten Commandments, and they are an expansion on those very things. Um, But yet, we have people saying, law of Moses, nail it to the cross, because uh, they say it's contrary to us and it testifies against us. Well, let me ask you a question. And please don't consider me rude for saying this. Um, They'll tell you that if it's not on the rocks in the box or under the mercy seat on the tables of stone. um, Remember, the uh, the statutes were put in a book in the side of the ark. Well, they'll say, well, those were done away because they testified against us. Contrary to us. Let me ask you a question. If you transgress what's on those 10 commandments on the stone, can it do anything but be contrary to you and testify against you? So because something tells the truth about us as transgressors, are we to say, no, that's contrary to us. It testifies against me. I've got to nail it to the cross. You know, if you look at this in a consistent way, well, I guess apostates don't have to be consistent, do they? So over 1,800 years, whoops, I got to go back there, uh, after the cross, um, well, let's look at the nature of the appointed times. Um, It doesn't appear that they are past rites and ceremonies, but as times of judgment and deliverance. So let's look at um, a very familiar quote to us from the Great Controversy, 398, 399. And this is foundational, of course. That which led to this movement was the discovery that the decree of Artaxerxes for the restoration of Jerusalem, which formed the starting point for the period of the 2300 days, referring to Daniel 814, went into effect in the autumn of the year BC 457 and not at the beginning of the year, as had been formerly believed. The seventh month movement, by the way, uh, made some adjustments. As had been formerly believed, reckoning from the autumn of 457, the 2300 day years terminate in the autumn of 1844. 
This was made very clear as attention was given to the manner in which the types relating to the first advent of Christ had been fulfilled. The slaying of the Passover lamb was a shadow of the death of Christ. Says Paul, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Uh, Paul says, in speaking of the resurrection of the Lord and of all his people, Christ the firstfruits, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. The first ripe grain gathered before the harvest. Christ is the first fruits of that immortal harvest of redeemed ones that at the future resurrection shall be gathered into the garner of God. And this is very important, this last and These types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the time. In like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. Unquote. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Um, right around the time I met all of you was about the time that I was coming into a correct understanding of the appointed times, uh, about 2015. And I'd been in the work about, uh, well, over 10 years. And yet, when I read The Great Controversy, which is the book that brought me in, I did not see the significance of this. I don't know how many times uh, I read over it and overlooked it. But in like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. So without an understanding of that, uh, how can you know when the time is near even at the door. But if you have an understanding of these appointed times, then you do know not only the signs of the times, the corruption, the moral uh, debauchery, everything that's going on around us, but you also know it because it echoes from the word of the Most High. It echoes, it comes through, through these harvest periods that he calls us together for and to be with him so that he can speak to us and speak through us. Um, that's what he gives us these appointed times for us to collect us together. He has a message and a blessing for us. And we miss a lot when we just overlook this or we listen to overly respected teachers, theologians, and I'm going to use air quotes around that, uh, and doctors of divinity. Uh, they'll cause us to totally miss the prescribed appointment. So let's go now. I want to look at the same book, Great Controversy 456, the preaching of a definite time for the judgment in giving the giving of the first message was ordered of God. The computation of the prophetic periods on which the message was based Placing the close of the 2300 days in the autumn of 1844 stands without impeachment. Does what? Stands without impeachment. I don't know how many of you know people uh, that are impeaching this, but that's also not a job description I would want to be involved with. Um, but they do it by changing even uh, how you reckon the number of the days. And they'll, well, I won't get into that. But so study of Jehovah's appointed times and laws as present truth, the 2300 days of Daniel 8, 14, October 22nd, it formed the foundation of the movement and some are busy sledgehammering away at the foundation. And many, uh, again, air quotes, SDA scholar and follower has done violence to the foundations of the Advent movement, um, or in other words, <laughs> impeaching. Uh, it's an impeachment process. So as did uh, Lucifer, um, there are those that uh, are being about this business here. and. Uh, I um, 
having a little trouble here. Uh, but what they do is they'll gain sympathy um, and they use uh, popularity, their popularity and sophisticated insinuations to subvert and recruit other sympathizers to also do violence against the divine statutes, times and laws. And they also convince them that they're doing God's service. And, um, you know, I'm kind of referring to John 16, too, when they'll cast you out of the synagogues and even kill you and think they're doing God's service. Uh, so there's a delusion involved in that. I don't know how many of you have been put out for seeking to observe God's worship times and laws, um, but most certainly we've gotten the uh, unwelcome mat or the left foot of fellowship. Um, but let's look at Testimonies, Volume 3, page 328. Um, there are ever to be found those who will sympathize with those who are wrong. Um, Satan had sympathizers in heaven and took large numbers of the angels with him. The insinuations of Satan took effect, and they really came to believe that the Father and the Son were their enemies and that Satan was their benefactor. Satan has the same power and the same control over minds now, only it has increased a hundredfold by exercise and experience. Men and women today are deceived, blinded by his insinuations and devices, and know it not. And before I go on to the rest of that quote, I wonder how many fold the intelligence of unfallen angels are or were than what we carry around so many thousand years after our creation when we were once in the image of God. I think we're intellectually stunted, and yet his power to deceive and control minds has increased a hundredfold by exercise and experience. Now you can exponentially multiply that against how far we have slidden down. And if he could fool angels, what can he do with our, pardon my term, skulls full of mush these days if we're left unguarded by the word or if we alter it or um, become sympathizers with those who subvert the word of the Most High? So continuing that quote, by giving place to doubts and unbelief in regard to the work of God and by cherishing feelings of distrust and cruel jealousies, they are preparing themselves for complete deception. They rise up with bitter feelings against the ones who dare to speak of their errors and reprove their sins. Before I go on with that quote, sometimes you don't even have to speak. It's the way you live that causes them to feel <laughs> reproved. Going on. Those who have, in the fear of God, ventured out to fearfully, faithful, excuse me, those who have, in the fear of God, ventured out to faithfully meet error and sin, calling sin by its right name, have discharged a disagreeable duty with much suffering of feelings to themselves. The sympathizers are on the wrong side, and they carry out the purposes of Satan to defeat the design of God. So um, it was mentioned in the meetings between um, the last presentation uh, that our defense, and especially down to these last days uh, against Satan and his insinuations and his method of operation, the very best way that we can meet them is with, it is written. And the very best of humanity uh, also did that. If we look at uh, Yeshua in Matthew 4, verses 5 through 7, it says, Then the devil took him up uh, into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of a temple and said unto him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written. Now notice how he uses misapplications. It is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. 
Now, by the way, isn't that interesting that when Yeshua did these things, he quite often, if not exclusively, quoted statutes. And this one was from Deuteronomy 6.16. Is he a safe pattern to follow in these kinds of ways to answer um, temptations and misapplications of scripture? So I believe the answer is absolutely yes. And in 1 Peter 2, 21 and 1 John 2, 6, we see something here that he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So where does Yeshua fail to be an example to follow after? So can we safely follow his example according to the law and the testimony? In testing applications of scripture, could it be that uh, what we eat, even the days that we keep and how we keep them, is following his example always a moral issue? So let no man judge you, therefore, in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath, because it is a moral issue. And yet, People will artfully use theology and nail to the cross what does not belong there. So his example in moral, moral, uh, moral versus ceremonial law and observance. So is his uh, example still a safe one to follow? And I believe you also uh, accept that that answer is yes. But let's look at something in Bible Echo, uh, October 31st, uh, 1898. And it says the commander of heaven became subject to command, but in it all, he manifested hardiness and devotion. He was a perfect pattern in every place. Now notice this, Christ passed through all the experiences of his childhood, youth and manhood without the observance of ceremonial temple worship. He passed through the experience of infancy, childhood, and manhood without a stain upon his character. He consecrated himself to God that he might benefit and bless others to show that in every period of life, the human agent can do the master's will. Now, so let's come back to this. Uh, what about the way he ate? What about the times he kept and how? Is he a safe one to follow? especially now after the cross, where we would be apostates if we did so uh, with ceremonial uh, temple worship or even the ceremonies outside the temple. But here, Christ, our perfect pattern in every place, and I would suggest you could insert time, without the observance of ceremonial temple worship. So is it possible that you can observe the times? I would say more than that. Um, but now notice, um, uh, I believe it was Butler in 1888 that told, uh, the people at the Minneapolis conference to hold the line and Butler's position, he was the president of the general conference at the time. And uh, I guess, uh, <laughs> the most high allowed him to be there because we're to be tested, uh, by heresies. And the way that he um, used the law in Galatians is really quite interesting. Uh, so whether by knowledge or ignorantly, uh, sympathizers use verses that describe partially converted idol worshipers that we see in uh, Galatians, um, describing their return to astrology and pagan holidays to undermine the foundations of divine and institutions, which are, of course, include God's times and laws. But look at how this is used. Galatians 4, 8 through 10. And uh, Elder John Vandenberg uh, treated on this quite well <laughs> a lot of times, but it says, how be it then when you knew not God, you did service to them, which by nature are no gods. But now, and what is the context? 
before you knew God and doing service to them, which are by nature, no gods. Okay. Verse nine. But now after you have known God or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. Now there are those among us uh, and um, Butler was one of those. And I believe Uriah Smith, they applied that to uh, the weak and beggarly elements to divine times and laws. Um, but it really were the times of laws and laws of those that were by nature no gods that they had returned to. So even a surface historical or biblical uh, research, it reveals that pagan observance is what is now called, let's just use the big ones, Christmas, Easter, and Sunday, every one of which predate Christianity, and pagans were bound to observe them as homage to their false gods that uh, Paul calls no gods. Okay, these are clearly weak and beggarly contrivances of our enemy, of Satan, and it's been reintroduced into Christendom, and I emphasize dumb, by Rome. And, you know, we can look at Daniel 725, and I think probably most of us in the past have observed these um, pagan holidays uh, in a Christian-looking dress, so to speak. Um, but we grow, hopefully. But instead, many of our churches that have retrieved back the seventh-day Sabbath continue to use these uh, weak and beggarly elements as outreach to, uh, you know, do Christmas sings and Easter cantatas and use them as outreach. But really, that's extending a pagan arm to draw people in. It's got to do damage to the rest of our experience. So. Um, let's look, uh, was Christ following Christ's example and law? Um, well, let's look at that in comparison to popular applications of, uh, Galatians 4, 8 through 10. Um, Deuteronomy 12, 2 through 32, and I've got it, uh, greatly abbreviated. Um, we're instructed, you shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations serve their gods upon the high mountains, upon the hills, under every green tree. <laughs> I wonder how many people bow down to open presents under a green tree. Uh, verse 30, be not snared by following them, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. You shall not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord which he hates have they done unto their gods. Verse 32, what things soever I command you, observe to do it, you shall not add thereto, nor diminish from it. So, you know, as we look at this, Christians or quote unquote Christians ignore this and they bring the annual heathen truth, you know, times. And they do the trees and, uh, of course, for community outreach, as we mentioned earlier, but they're bold to stigmatize annual times and laws instituted by Yeshua as Jewish and weak and beggarly elements and bondage even. Yet Yeshua observed them. And decades after the cross, Paul also did, and even among Gentile converts, and we're going to peel into this a little deeper. But is it possible to uh, embrace pagan holidays and even reject covenant times and laws as weak and beggarly without denying Christ? And can we safely deny Christ uh, in any way without endangering our souls and those that would follow our example? So by using these weak and beggarly elements, we are in denial of Christ and people will see. What kind of influence can Adventism have by doing things like that? It's not a positive one. So here's another question. Did God employ uh, weak and beggarly elements to teach his children? So we're going to do a little comparison of the weak and beggarly. 
application of the times and laws in Galatians to selected messages, uh, volume 1, 233 and 234. Inspiration says, I am asked concerning the law in Galatians. What law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? I answer both the ceremonial and moral code of Ten Commandments. Christ was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. Who was? Christ was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. Was he weak and beggarly? Well, that's that application that was being used in 1888. Again, Christ was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. The death of Abel was in consequence of Cain's refusing to accept God's plan in the school of obedience to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. This whole ceremony was prepared by God, and Christ became the foundation of the whole system. This is the beginning of its work as the schoolmaster to bring sinful human agents to a consideration of Christ, the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. This service was designed to create in every heart a love for the law of God, which is the law of his kingdom. And before I finish, I just want to ask you, is that moral in nature to create in every heart a love for the law of God, which is the law of his kingdom? Or is that merely ceremonial and weak and beggarly? Going back to the quote, the sacrificial offering was to be an object lesson of the love of God revealed in Christ. In the contemplation of this great theme of salvation, we see Christ's work. Not only the promised gift of the Spirit, but also the nature and character of his sacrifice and intervention are subjects which should create in our hearts elevated, sacred, high ideas of the law of God, which holds its claim upon every human agency. Now, after reading that, let me ask you, does that sound weak? and beggarly or engendering bondage? Does it sound moral? So, uh, Selected Messages, Volume 1, 232. Those who cherish the view that there was no Savior in the old dispensation have as dark a veil over their understanding as did the Jews who rejected Christ, the divine Son of God. They rejected him and refused to accept the plainest evidence of his true character. The Christian church, on the other hand, who professed the utmost faith in Christ, in despising the Jewish system, virtually deny Christ, who was the originator of the entire Jewish economy. So that entire Jewish economy, is that a weak and beggarly schoolmaster to God's children? Would he use a weak and beggarly? No. So that's an insult to Jehovah uh, being heaped on him uh, by labeling that weak and beggarly and merely ceremonial uh, and not connected in any way to morality. Um, <clears throat> he isn't going to use just a ceremonial schoolmaster, um, but it had built into it a moral teacher. Uh, Matthew 10, 32 and 10, 33, it says, Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my father. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my father. Especially as we're coming close to the close of probation, is this an extremely dangerous thing to do? or to listen to teachers um, that could lead you in that direction. So this is interesting. On his way uh, to the Feast of Tabernacles, um, Yeshua took a detour to Samaria, and he gave us a truth about where the center of true worship would soon be. And we find this, of course, in John 4, 21 through 24. But in uh, commenting on that, uh, Review and Herald, July 7th, 1896 reads, when Jesus spoke to the woman of Samaria, he was not presenting the gospel invitation to her alone, but to the thousands upon thousands who would read his words. Jesus traveled up and down the breadth of the land, giving his invitation to the feast. 
When the sun illuminated the landscape, Jesus said to the vast throng, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He took the opportunity of presenting himself to the people during the feast days. When they gathered at Jerusalem, the people met together to carry out the instructions given to Moses to observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. And after that, thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine, and Jesus stood himself stood in the midst of them. Now, again, just that reminder, was he a perfect pattern in every place? He kept the feast, and just as a reminder, what we read from Bible Echoes, without the observance of ceremonial temple worship. Now, that instruction that he gave the woman at the well, he said that the hour is coming and now is when he shall neither worship in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem. But those that will worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. Can you do that at the right times any place in the world? I believe so, without ceremonial temple worship, without sacrifice. I think so. So, um, Review and Herald, um, July 7th, 1856. Um, and uh, he was speaking about the Day of Atonement, uh, which occurred on the 10th day of the seventh month, or inspiration, uh, 10th day of the seventh month, when everyone was to afflict his soul by confessing his sins, both to the Lord and to his brethren. This humiliation was to prepare the way for the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles, which lasted seven days and was a memorial of the protecting care of God when he led Israel through the wilderness. In the instruction to Moses, he said, also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of thy land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. And by the way, in Leviticus 23, 33 through uh, 43, it quoted a statute forever. Okay, moving on. It was the to the celebration of this feast that Jesus came. It was in the midst of the feast when Jesus went up to the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, how knows this man letters, having never learned? Jesus spoke with a depth of knowledge far exceeding that of most of the learned scribes, the most learned scribes, of the scribes and rabbis. He said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, what was his doctrine? Didn't he walk the doctrine he taught? And is that a safe example to follow? I certainly think so, and I'm believe you do also, but um, he is the unimpeachable uh, Sabbath-keeping example, and here's some perfect examples, uh, also feast-keeping examples. Let's look at a, a few of them. I'm just going to run through them. Um, Yeshua here in Luke 4.16, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. We always use this in evangelism, and we use it as a perfect example. We follow his example, uh, Paul, in Acts 17.2, and Paul, remember where he got his gospel, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them. So we always use these as proof text in our evangelism and Bible studies uh, about Jesus and Paul's Sabbath keeping as admissible evidence, and of course, perfect examples to follow, yet you're taught to look at the feast observance as inadmissible or, in, un, or excuse me, impeachable, the way that they observe them. Now, is that consistent? So Jesus, uh, as we're going to repeat from Bible Echoes, uh, a perfect pattern in every place. He and Paul, they both kept the feast and the Sabbath without the observance of ceremonial temple worship. 
uh, ceremonial rites, sacrifices, and offerings were required on the seventh day Sabbath as well, as we're going to read in Numbers 28, 9, and 10. It says, on the Sabbath day, two lambs and two tenths deals of flour for a meat offering mingled with oil and the drink offering thereof. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath besides the continual offering and his drink offering. So the common logic that's used, uh, just in repetition here, is that ceremonial rites, sacrifices, and offerings uh, required on a day um, disqualify it as a day of worship. They say that about, of course, um, feast keeping. Uh, but what about Sabbath keeping? So consistency would demand that you don't do that. But then again, people don't have to be consistent. <laughs> I guess they think. Um, so let's look at his um, pattern, his example. Uh, is it worthy of following? If not, where did he say we should stop following it? So let's look at a few. John 2.23, he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day. So this was the first Passover when uh, he cleansed the temple. Uh, the second one in uh, John 5, 1. After this, there was a feast and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And this was the second Passover where he healed the crippled man at Bethesda. Here's another one in John, this time 6, 4. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. And this is uh, just before the third Passover. He fed the 5,000. Let's look at a fourth one. John 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 2 and through 39, just abbreviated. Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacles was at hand. And a lot of people will capitalize on that. Oh, that's the feast of the Jews. Well, uh, who else was keeping and following the example that was given? through the law and the testimony. Okay. Now uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, and he said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's what we want, isn't it? Uh, we don't want to just drink it all in ourselves, but we want to be able to pour it out for others. And that's what he wants us to do as well. Uh, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke, but this spoke he of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So he promised what was going to happen after Pentecost. So we have just a couple more. I'm just giving, uh, maybe overdoing the examples, but John 12, uh, 12, 20, and then we'll go into 13, 1. It says, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So here's the final Passover and that triumphal entry. And there were certain Greeks that came up to worship at the feast. This is John 13, 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come. And that hour uh, changed the lamb to bread and wine and the institution of the foot washing in regard to how the Passover would be observed. Okay, Luke 22, 14 through 16. And when the hour was come, he said, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So a future Passover. That out of whose mouth? until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, even many of our pioneers that saw the efficacy of a continuation of the fall feast kind of um, 
said, well, this was completely fulfilled, uh, the spring feast. But as we look at that, um, we see that he spoke in a very clear sense of a future Passover. Very clear. I don't want to deny that. So where did Paul get his instruction? We see in Galatians 1.12, uh, he says, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he got it by direct revelation. Um, so let's look at what he did after getting that revelation in AD 55, Paul's manner of feast keeping. So Acts chapter 18 19 through 21, he came to Ephesus and he entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews, and they desired him to tarry longer, but he bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that comes in Jerusalem. Now, do you think he went there to uh, partake in ceremonial temple worship? I don't think so. I think they wanted him dead, but I really think he understood and very sure that he understood that Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, he said. So he was there. Um, there is instruction that tells us that he was there to share a gift. He wanted to share a gift from the Gentile churches. But let's look in 60 AD. Uh, his manner with both Jews and Gentiles seemed to remain the same. Um, Acts chapter 20, verses 6 through 16 uh, says, we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came to them at Troas, and we sailed thence and came to Miletus. For Paul determined to sail by Ephesus, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So let's look at a, um, a little bit more of this in the spirit of prophecy in just a minute. But one more. Uh, Paul, remember, um, he's the same one in this same book that said God's not the author of confusion, and he got his revelation from Jesus Christ himself, but he says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8, purge out, therefore, the old leaven, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. Sincerity and truth. Well, if it was nailed to the cross and it would be an insult to Jehovah, uh, wouldn't that be kind of confusing to continue to use uh, with Gentile followers, um, people who would be converts and become Israel? Would it be a uh, confusion to use this beast language? So, if these times were the weak and beggarly elements, why confuse the issue teaching them uh, to keep it or using words that would even suggest it? Uh, wouldn't that be holding the truth in unrighteousness? And there are those that say, well, Paul was just the standard stiff-necked Jew, and, and he struggled with giving up the Jewish religion. But now notice how he treated Peter. In Galatians chapter 2, Verse 11 through 14, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away. But when I saw they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compel you the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So by the way, uh, have you ever heard, it's better to walk the walk than to just talk the talk? But um, so here, Paul confronted Peter because he was walking a different gospel, not just talking, but he was a, an example that was denying what Christ had done for the Gentile. So either Paul is a hypocrite or he taught the feast in sincerity and in truth, as we 
look at this. And he, good for Peter, confronted him for his hypocrisy. And you can see in uh, 2 Peter um, that he actually thanked Paul for that. So he took the correction. So we got just a couple more. And I, this is where we want to peel in to that last missionary journey in the book of Acts of the Apostles 389 through 391. Paul greatly desired to reach Jerusalem before the Passover, having completed his work at Corinth. Now, what did we just read that he said at Corinth? To do what? Because Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. Okay, that he had taught in Corinth. Having completed his work at Corinth, he determined to sail directly for Palestine when he was told of a plot by the Jews to take his life. Now, this is very important, these next couple of lines. From every quarter were coming accounts of the spread of the new doctrine. Where did he get his doctrine? By direct revelation from Christ, as we read in Galatians 1. New doctrine by which the Jews were released from the observance of the rites of the ceremonial law. Keep this in mind. Paul taught that the Jews were released from the observance of the rites of the ceremonial law. Um, supplied word. This was regarded by his enemies as daring blasphemy, and they determined that his voice should be silenced. Upon receiving warning of the plot, Paul decided to go around by way of Macedonia. His plan to reach Jerusalem in time for the Passover services had to be given up, but he hoped to be there at Pentecost. Now, by the way, the argument that we hear all the time is the feast are ceremonial. Well, Paul knew that. Yeshua had spoken directly to him and gave him his gospel, and he repeated that by telling the, the Jews that they were released from the observance of the rites of the ceremonial law. So wouldn't this be completely hypocritical for him to want to be in Jerusalem at the time for Passover service and also at Pentecost? But notice this next one. At Philippi, of course, a Gentile uh, area, at Philippi, Paul tarried to keep the Passover. So again, if the feasts were weak and beggarly, ceremonial or bondage, what in the world is Paul doing? It says only Luke remained with him. The Philippians were the most loving and true-hearted of the apostles' converts. And during the eight days of the feast, he enjoyed peaceful and happy communion with them. Wow. Wow. So, like a sundial, you know, people use this uh, terminology of uh, shadows. Um, a sundial, depending on where it is in the track of time during the day, it either casts a shadow this way or this way. And in the same way, the feast uh, tracked to the sun of righteousness, past, present, and future. And now in 64 AD, Paul was inspired to write of those. In Colossians, we already read uh, 2, 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come. So they still, as that whole plan of salvation was there, um, a compacted prophecy of the plan of redemption, they are commemorative as well as typical for things to come. So our Adventist pioneers and Ellen White were learning of these and speaking of them in the same way and not against them as abolished rites and ceremonies. And that's where people get into trouble is when they interpolate in uh, rites and ceremonies, when the word feast or in reference to time, uh, they're not exactly the same, though we're done on that same time. So in Proverbs 4, 1, 2, and then 18 and 19, here are the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding, for I give you good doctrines, forsake ye not my law, but the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness, they know not at what they stumble. 
Now, would a, a, a wicked person be defined as somebody who breaks the moral law? And if the father of lights says to his children of lights, I want you to meet me and meet together three times during the year. And there was no expiration date on that, that they were not nailed to the cross. Would it be a wicked person? Um, would a wicked person stumble at that? Um, does he call us out of our wickedness if we do so uh, in ignorance? I thank him that yes, he does, but it's still wickedness and especially wickedness to tell other people to deny the invitation of the Father to come and meet him uh, and have fellowship one with another, both vertically to walk in the light um, as the father of light shines it on his children of light's path. And that light shines more and more unto the perfect day. And in the next messages, we're going to look at um, admissions of the pagan papal power, even some braggadocio that they took them out of the faith and experience of Christendom and replaced them with their pagan counterfeits. And um, I have probably a lot more to this message. Not probably, I do. But I don't want to interfere with others' time. But I think we've seen quite a bit here. And there is some counsel. In fact, maybe I can get to it real quick. Yeah, let's do this. I want to look at uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 540 to 542. Speaking of um, the Feast of Tabernacles, which we're observing right now. And it is a blessing. Uh, regarding to the Feast of Tabernacles was commemorative, and it was in memory of the pilgrim life in the wilderness. Uh, at these yearly assemblies, the hearts of young and old and young would be encouraged in the service of God. Now, in the service of God, would that be uh, moral or just ceremonial? I think to serve God is moral, isn't it? Wouldn't it be immoral to not serve God, and would it be immoral to not want to encourage others in that? I think think we see that clear. While the association of the people from the different quarters of the land would strengthen the ties that bound them to God and to one another. Isn't that interesting? Remember the, um, the greatest commandment and the one that was just like it? I'm just going to paraphrase it. Um, <clears throat> to love God with all our heart and our soul, our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. So isn't that encompassed in what the, the feast does? It says um, it would strengthen the ties that bound them to God and to one another. Well, would it be for the people of God at the present time to have a feast of tabernacle, a joyous commemoration of the blessings of God to them as the children of Israel celebrated the deliverance that God had wrought for their fathers, so should we gratefully call to mind the various ways he has devised for bringing us out from the world and from the darkness of error into the precious light of his grace and truth. Now, here's the clincher here, but I want to come back. Well, would it be for the people of God at the present time to have a Feast of Tabernacles? When's the best time to have a Feast? to tabernacles, if we're going to be bound closer to God and to one another, wouldn't it be at the time that he calls us to have the Feast of Tabernacles? In the same way, we wouldn't say, well, would it be to keep the Sabbath on Wednesday? No, you keep the Sabbath on Sabbath. Why not keep the Feast of Tabernacles on the Feast of Tabernacles? Since everything else he does is on time. But uh, let's go on down to the bottom. The Feast of Tabernacles was not only commemorative, but typical. Like Paul said, were shadows, or oh no, not were, are shadows of things to come. So, um, so it not only pointed back to their time uh, um, to the wilderness sojourn, but as the Feast of Harvest, it celebrated the ingathering of the fruits of the earth, and pointed forward to the great day of final ingathering when the Lord of harvest shall send forth his reapers 
to gather the tares together in bundles for the fire and to gather the wheat into his garner. At that time, the wicked will all be destroyed. They will become as though they had not been, Obadiah 16. And every voice in the whole universe will unite in joyful praise to God. And Revelation 5, 13 is quoted, the people of Israel praise God at the Feast of Tabernacles as they called to mind his mercy and their deliverance from the bondage of Egypt and his tender care for them during their pilgrim life in the wilderness. They rejoiced also in the consciousness of pardon and accepted acceptance through the service of the Day of Atonement just ended. Isn't that what we're doing? But friends, we know that it points forward to a great deliverance. When the Lord shall have, uh, when the people of the Lord shall have been safely gathered into the heavenly Canaan, forever delivered from the bondage of the curse, under which the whole creation groans and travails in pain until now, they will rejoice without, excuse me, with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Christ's great work of the atonement for men will then have been completed and their sins will have been forever blotted out. So friends, when we look at these things and we go back to what Peter preached when he had that experience that they all gained on Pentecost that day, he made one final call. And I want to use it to end this message. Acts 3:19 through 21. Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The restitution of all things. The restitution of the worship of the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. The restitution of the appointed times which the beast has stolen, basically counterfeited and replaced. Is the reformation or the restitution completed? It's not yet, is it? I want to be about that. And we see that it does point forward, and we've seen through this message that it will be that final uh, summer fruits harvest is going to take place at the Feast of Ingathering. We want to be ready. We know that the time is getting closer, and if we study the appointed times, we know when it's near, even at the door. And no wonder the beast thinks to change these times and laws of the lamb. Satan wants you to miss the blessings that he's provided for us through them. And you know, when we think of all the people that are missing it, and we know we've tasted and seen that the Lord is good just from the Sabbath, and there's a feast <laughs> to feast and see that the Lord is really, really good, at these appointed times, why would we want people to miss it? And since he's given it to us, shouldn't out of our, our bellies pour rivers of living water to share it with them, to proclaim them in their seasons and invite them to join? And that's something that I, I really enjoy about the feast is um, just that fellowship time. And um, though in this particular one, in the first few days, we have to do it electronically. It's still very good to see faces that were there when I first started keeping um, the feast when uh, Brother Vandenberg invited us to come. And uh, it's, it's still a great blessing. But Satan wants people to miss it, to not be ready, to not be looking at this whole plan of salvation in this chain. He wants the links broken. He wants to destroy the foundations and cause people to be unprepared. So Heavenly Father, um, help us to be about the work of restoring the faith once delivered to the saints. We know that your coming uh, is, and your son's return is um, going to be for a covenant-keeping people. 
And we see that these times are intrinsically moral. They're used to prepare us for that coming, that your bride might be ready. And Heavenly Father, I would just ask that um, you would help us not only to be ready, but we know that we grow in the faith, especially as we share it. Help us, send us out, that your living water will pour out and uh, refresh others and call them to a greater experience, even as the path of the just shines more and more, even to the perfect day. We know that it's coming soon. Again, help us to be about your service. And thank you that you have given us these gifts of time when you pour out a greater measure of your spirit for us. Uh, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the whole plan of redemption, of which these are um, very important parts. We want to hold your truth and righteousness, uh, not an unrighteousness and not diminishing from them. So thank you again for calling us together um, and helping us to look forward to that time when you'll come and gather your saints to yourself. And we'll be in that new Jerusalem and tabernacle with you there. Thank you once more in Yeshua's name. Amen. You know, Dean, one of the things I find really uh, exciting about Jesus is our Passover lamb. Mm -hmm. There were two Passovers, a morning, uh, I mean, two sacrifices, a morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. Jesus was crucified at nine in the morning, which was the same time as the morning sacrifice. And he died at three in the afternoon, the same time as the evening sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything is on time. Right. But, Amen. Our, but his crucifixion and death is our Passover lamb coincided with the uh, uh, sacrificial lambs that they were doing. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. Amen. Before, before we uh, go on and I turn the YouTube off and back on again, um, I don't know how many of you have heard, probably most of you, you know, Pam and Gerald um, Benton. I think the end of August, he was up on a roof and fell and yeah. he was unconscious. They said it wasn't any broken bones, but I think he's still in rehab. Yeah. I haven't I haven't been able to get a whole lot of update, but it's pretty serious. So keep them in prayer. And I just got a message from Diane DeWitt and, you know, Hein in Africa, Hein and Diane, Hein and Diane has been sick for quite a while and trying to get better work from home. And I just found out today that he is very dizzy and nauseous, kind of sounds like the flu or something, not doing well at all. He's supposed to speak tomorrow. So please keep both of them in prayer so that they'll be okay because the devil's working hard. That's I, um, his job is to try to destroy us. Okay, go ahead and uh, keep talking. I'll get this off and back on. Okay, I had been in touch with Pam, um, what, 